Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights Into Tomorrow. This is Episode 1, Presidential Impeachment. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my talented and insightful co-host, Sam Whalen. How are you doing today, Sam? I'm doing good. Thank you for joining us in studio today. Uh, usually you are coming in via Skype, but we do have you in studio today. And uh, we're going to be talking about what is probably pretty big in the news right now, and that is uh, the subject of impeachment. And I think our challenge today is to do so without getting overly political, which I think you'll agree is probably challenging with this topic. Yeah, I mean, it's inherently political, but, you know, we're going to do our best. So I would like to take a look at what impeachment is, a little bit of history uh, on past impeachments, and then as we do with the show how look into the future and see what we think uh, the current cycle of political impeachment will have mean for the company, uh, country. So uh, let's get started. First off, we'll talk about what impeachment is and um, actually take a look at some of the text from the Constitution describing it. <music> So I'm going to go with a definition that we are taking from Wikipedia because I found it on the internet. It must be true. Um, impeachment is a process by which a legislative body levels charges against a government official. Impeachment does not in itself remove the official from office. It's the equivalent to an indictment in criminal law and thus is only the statement of charges against the official. Once an individual is impeached, they must then face the possibility of conviction on the charges by a legislative vote, which is separate from the impeachment but flows from it, and a judgment which convicts the official on the articles of impeachment. Um, a conviction would entail the official's removal from office. So I think the first takeaway from that is everyone thinks when you're when you impeach a government official that they're going to get removed from office. Um, and I like this definition because it gives you a parallel to something that, that most people are familiar with. And that is a criminal investigation. You know, when you, when someone is accused of a crime, they are indicted for it. And that indictment is really just the state leveling accusations. The state then has to prove those allegations in a court of law. And then if found guilty by, a jury in this case, there's a, a penalty phase associated with it where the judgment is. <clears throat> so it's important in, in our context here to understand that when we're talking impeachment, we're talking about that early stage of the process of leveling these charges at a president. Um, comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of we kind of covered it already, but there's a big misconception of what impeachment actually is. And I'm sure we're going to, we're going to touch on that more later, but like you said, impeachment doesn't equal removal from office. There's a lot more that's got to go into that. And we'll look at later those examples where there was impeachment proceedings and either nothing came of it or, you know, the, the president at the time took steps to, to get out of it. So impeachment, it's not quite as, you know, cut and dry as a lot of people think. So Exactly. And, and really at this point in time, I mean, not taking political sides here, you know, we can state the facts that right now Democrats are running impeachment um, hearings. These hearings are designed to, to 
um, determine if there's sufficient evidence to actually lodge official impeachment articles of impeachment against the president. Um, so that's the first step to this process. Now, impeachment itself is kind of interesting when it comes to the president because um, based on the Constitution itself, uh, Article 1, Section 2, uh, Clause 5, for those uh, lawyers out there, tells us that the president and vice president and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office for impeachment for conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanor. It also tells us that the House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment. And if everyone thinks back to their social studies, high school social studies and history, this is this is part of the checks and balances, right? Yeah. And I mean, they had it figured out back then to a certain extent. I mean, treason, bribery, and other... High, that's That last part is where we kind of get um, a little in the weeds, other high crimes and misdemeanors, because that's kind of broad. Right. And it can be applied to a lot of things, which is what part of the dialogue is today uh, over, you know, President Trump. Right. And, and, you know, the precise meaning of what high crimes and misdemeanors is has never been fully defined by the Constitution. And as brilliant as our founding fathers were, you have to think that they kind of saw this as being something that shouldn't be explicitly defined because it's going to depend entirely on circumstance. Yeah, exactly. And I think, especially when you're dealing with law, if something isn't specifically stated, that's where lawyers can get in there and make a lot of their argument. And I believe, wasn't Thomas Jefferson a lawyer? So we had a lot of yeah. law-centric minds you know, drafting this document. So they knew what they were doing when they put that in there. And, and it's probably for things like this where you can you have that wiggle room where it's open to interpretation. Yeah, and, and there was a lot of uh, contributing sources for how impeachment was laid out in the Constitution. Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers 65 described impeachment offenses as arising from the misconduct of public men or, in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. Um, so it puts a little bit more definition behind it, even though these papers, you know, the Constitution doesn't consist of these papers. This, they, they kind of serve as guidance for those who are weighing in on these matters as to what the intention was. And a lot of times, um, things like this, especially when it comes to presidential impeachments, tend to get up to the Supreme Court level. And the Supreme Court does tend to weigh in on these historical documents to interpret whether or not the, the original foundation of these uh, laws and, and articles in the Constitution meant one thing or another. Um, but again, this stuff really isn't clearly defined from a constitutional standpoint. Um, I think it's clear when we talk about um, bribery, okay? That's, that's pretty cut and dry, black and white, when you have the evidence that's presented to you in that case. Um, treason, again, could be pretty black and white in most cases. Um, and I think one of the arguments that the Democrats are making at this point is um, President Trump's calls to have outside countries interfere or investigate. They're, they're labeling it as interference, but investigate uh, his political opponents is a form of treason because you're inviting outside uh, governments to take part in our elections. And that's one of the clauses. We haven't seen articles of impeachment come out of the House yet, but I would suspect that that's one of the articles of impeachment that we're probably going to see them lean heavily on, um, and less so on the high crimes and misdemeanors because they are difficult to um, to really define. Yeah, I mean, you had mentioned that the uh, bribery and and treason can be kind of cut and dry, and I'm and I'm not sure in today's world that they are because I mean, for bribery, would you consider you know a high donation for a campaign? you know, finance level to, it's not technically bribery, but if you've got lobbyists or someone that's, you know, funding your campaign, you're going to be influenced to, you know, 
aim for policies that they would want to go for. I mean, it's not bribery per se, but the effect can still be the same. And with treason, the Founding Fathers had no idea of the kind of global world that we'd be dealing with today. So when you're interacting with foreign governments, where do you draw that line of, am I helping the United States or am I furthering a more global agenda, you know? And that's a very good point. From a bribery standpoint, though, we do have other more modern laws. You know, we have campaign finance laws that are very well defined in this case. Some may say that they're a little too loose. Uh, Some may say they're too strict. But we have a set of guidelines that we can say, okay, if someone's giving you a campaign contribution, uh, is it within these guidelines? Either it is or it isn't. If it's not, then it's bribery. Um, treason, I think you you have a very good point there. Right now, treason is sort of held up as in the public interest more than anything else. If you're if you're conducting political operations or global operations that are not in the public interest, um, because the the president takes an oath of office to defend the Constitution, and if you're taking actions, and they're interpretable actions, but if you're taking actions that are contrary to the defense of the Constitution, that is clear-cut treason once it's been interpreted. Um, So there's a little bit more wiggle room with those because they're a little more well-defined. High crimes and misdemeanors? Well, first of all, we've already been told, you know, the Department of Justice tells us that we cannot convict a sitting president. So then misdemeanors don't apply at that point, do they? If you can't convict them. (laughs) Um, And what crimes can you convict a president of? Well, if I can't convict him of a crime, then high crimes and misdemeanors are off the table at that point by definition. Um, So it's going to be interesting. And we don't know where it's going to go. We might not even get articles of impeachment if, if there is not enough information that's found. But until we do, we're not going to know which of these they're trying to um, a tribute to the president at this point in time. Um, a couple of other interesting things. Um, in the past, both houses of Congress have given the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors broad uh, reading, finding that impeachable offenses need not be limited to criminal conduct. And I think that's one of the interesting things that we have here. You have a lot of uh, controversy that seems to be swelling around President Trump at this time, people are on him for not releasing his tax documents. Well, there's not a legal requirement for him to release his his tax documents. You have uh, controversy around him inviting Ukraine and China to involve themselves in the political process. That's sort of where we're at right now, where are these impeachable offenses? Um, But at Above that, you're looking at other things that are less criminal. Uh, For instance, there was controversy about President Trump having an extramarital affair. That's not illegal. So you can't can't be impeached for that, um, even though they're saying that it doesn't need to be criminal conduct. Um, It's difficult to come up with articles of impeachment that don't involve some type of criminal activity. I mean, he did admit to sexual assault and then got elected. Um, and there have been other women that have come out and accused him of sexual assault. And I know that that's, that's a different kind of, you'd have to proceed differently with that because you don't have to deal with like statute limitations and things like that. Right. And you'd have to try each of those cases individually, which would take a while and he might be out of office by then anyway. So there's, that's might not be worth pursuing, but I think that is still something important to consider if we're looking at his criminal activity as a whole. Right. That's true. I mean, but again, is that something that a president can be convicted on? Uh, We saw similar charges lodged against President Clinton. And, you know, they were, he was acquitted of of any charges in that case. So it's kind of shaky ground. It wasn't like, you know, if you look at, for instance, uh, President Nixon. Okay, you know, and we'll talk a little bit more about impeachment history, but, you know, President Nixon was clearly involved once the tape, Watergate tapes came out. And, you know, that's what led to his resignation. So he wasn't convicted on impeachment, but 
likely he would have been because there was established criminal activity with a break in and a cover up and various other things. Um, and they occurred during his presidential term. Um, one side of the argument can say you can't um, impeach a president for activity that happened before he was in office, uh, in which case the sexual assault charges against Trump, which he was never convicted of, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't apply either. Uh, people are using that to, to basically say that he, that he doesn't need to release his tax returns either because the information they're trying to get from his tax returns were prior to his being elected to the office. And uh, one analogy that I had read, uh, and I forget the, the source that I found it at, basically said you can't hold a president accountable for cheating on a test in high school when he runs for president 30 years later. It, it just doesn't apply because it has nothing to do with his term in office. Yeah, I think it, the only way it would apply is just for the election. You know, you get – it's more character examples um, for an election, and that's stuff that's supposed to play into what you vote. But in terms of criminal proceedings, I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do, but you'd have to speak with your vote and speak with electing an official that you feel morally uh, is acceptable among other, you know, policy and all that. No, you're you're absolutely right there and, and to point that out because – these are things that should have influenced an election, and they did, because this information came out before an election, <clears throat> and President Trump won the election. So clearly the American public didn't really care too much about these things if that's the case. So, But anyway, you know, I just wanted to make sure we had a, a, a very good understanding of where, where we were in terms of the definition of impeachment. Let's talk a little bit about uh, impeachment history. So there have been three instances of impeachment activity in the history of the United States. And this comes actually from the uh, House of Representatives uh, website itself, history.house.gov. So the first was Andrew Johnson, who was the president, who was uh, President Lincoln's vice president and took over the role after the assassination of Lincoln. Uh, he was charged for impeachment on February 24th, 1868, and the key charges were violation of the Tenure of Service Act for removing Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. Uh, ultimately, he was acquitted of this, but this um, this was largely a political posturing thing. If you look back at history on this, um, Andrew Johnson was a Southern senator uh, who was brought on by Lincoln um, in an attempt to try and bring the country back together. Um, Johnson was not a, uh, a, 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 he was not in favor of separation of, a, he was not a secessionist, I should say. <coughs> um, but he was a staunch Southerner and he had very uh, classical Southern ideas when it came to African Americans and slavery. Um, and he, he worked very hard to, um, try and stymie a lot of the reconstruction efforts um, in partially in an, in an attempt to expedite reconstruction, but also so that Southern landowners did not lose uh, a lot of power in the South. And um, he did some unconventional things. Um, he had passed laws uh, while Congress was in rece uh, recession, not recession, they were in summer session, um, and basically tried to ram certain things through that would not have been approved by the Senate at the time. And there was a law that was put in place by the Senate called the Tenure of Service Act that basically required uh, any 
cabinet member positions to be if you're if you were going to remove them you had to get congress's approval for it and he basically ignored that flaunted his power removed them removed uh secretary of war stanton from office and this is what the house latched onto to challenge him on and ultimately they they couldn't pin anything to him but it's similar to um some of the things that we're seeing with president trump now where you know democrats are trying to stop president trump from you know running his administration the way that he feels it should be run because it's in in contrast or or conflict with uh, how democrats largely think things should be run there's a lot of animosity um there's a lot of division in the country and i'll grant it you know, we're talking the end of a civil war here. So I think the country was probably a little more divided then than it is now, but there was still division either way. And uh, I think I think the impeachment of Andrew Johnson was more a f- move of frustration from Congress than anything else. And, and to a certain extent, that might be the case today with um, the Democrats trying to impeach Trump. Uh, because even if you look at the Democratic Party, they're very divided on how they want to handle the situation, and you're not seeing a whole lot of unity come through. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think you're you're absolutely right, and I I can see how it'd be a a move of frustration then and now. Um, it, it, it you do kind of get the impression that we're grasping, or the Democrats are grasping for straws, and they're trying to throw anything at the wall to get Trump and see what sticks. And I mean. He's also not really doing himself any favors with a lot of stuff that's come out, especially when he released um, the transcript of the phone call uh, with Ukraine. There was a lot of damning evidence in that. Um, but their def- uh, Trump's team's defense was, well, if we were guilty, why would we release it? Uh, but if you look at it, there's a lot of stuff in there that could lead to impeachment. And I don't remember it off the top of my head, but um, I'd seen a, an article that broke it, a lot of it down because there's a lot of information in there. Sure. Um, But yeah, I mean, similar to to Johnson, I'm not sure that it would result in, you know, removal from office. He might just be end up getting acquitted, especially if they go for the political angle like uh, Johnson had with removing the um, secretary of war instead of a more criminal angle. um, Right. What would stick? Right. Right. And in, you know, in the case of Andrew Johnson, it was. Congress basically said, oh, we, make a, we made a rule. He broke the rule, so now we're going to impeach him for it. Well, it wasn't a constitutional mandate. It wasn't a violation of the law. If anything, it might have been contempt of Congress. But is that an impeachable offense where the, the president should be removed? They didn't think it was at the time, so he was acquitted. The next example that we have is, is Bill Clinton. You know, this is in, in most of our time frame at this point. So Bill Clinton was impeached on December 19th of 1998. Uh, He was charged with a few more things. He was charged with lying on their oath, obstruction of justice, and ultimately he was acquitted as well. And uh, just to refresh people's memories, this had to do with the Monica Lewinsky incident, uh, the alleged affair that he had with his intern at that point. And lying on their oath is an impeachable offense and obstruction of justice, if proven, is an impeachable offense. Um, we, you know, um, there was a special prosecutor involved here, a la, you know, the Mueller investigation. Clinton had his own investigation. And uh, ultimately, he was acquitted of his as well because there was insufficient evidence to show... Um, to prove the charges against him. Now, again, like we said at the beginning, like you said at the beginning of the podcast, ultimately impeachment is a, by definition, political event. Um, I don't know how politically motivated a lot of the stuff was at the time for Bill Clinton. Uh, I think a lot of the impetus for the Clinton impeachment was what Congress thought the president should be or should act as or how 
appropriate the president should be. Um, and, and I think that came across more than political posturing really did. Although they, there was some in there, certainly. Um, and I think the parallel that we can draw between Clinton and Trump is Trump is not your traditional politician. Um, he says things, he does things uh, that you would not expect a politician to say or do. Um, and he acts in a way that some think is very unpresidential. So I think some of the fire that people have in their belly for impeachment on Trump is very similar to some of the of the reasoning that people had for Clinton. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think that's it. That sounds about right. I mean, I think a lot of it. You mentioned that Congress wanting a more presidential president, but I think it's also public sentiment as well. I mean, I'm sure I wasn't. I mean, obviously alive at the time, but I know certainly now there is a lot of public outcry for impeachment and against Trump's method of. Uh, you know, having the presidency and I can see why or how that would be similar with Clinton where, you know, he lied about having an affair with his wife and that's inherently almost anti-American. Like, you know, that was something that is very easy for American people to go against. Sure. And I think we're seeing a lot of that with Trump as well, where he's admitting a lot of things and he's acting in a lot of ways that we don't see as professional for someone at that level of power, well, the highest level of power that should be acting that way. And I think you have the public sentiment affecting congressional sentiment as well against him. Right. Right. And you know, being unpresidential is not an impeachable offense. Um, if anything, again, it's one of those things that should be played out at the polls, you know, let the American people choose. Uh, and the last example that we have, obviously we saved the best for last here is Richard Nixon. So <clears throat> Richard Nixon's date of impeachment was July 27th, 1974. Uh, that was when the first article of, of impeachment was approved by the House of Representative uh, House's Judiciary Committee. And his key charges were obstruction of justice, abuse of power, and contempt of Congress. Um, and that last one there, now both of, you know, we've seen abuse of power with Johnson, we've seen obstruction of justice with Clinton, but contempt of Congress is fresh with, with Nixon. And I think that speaks volumes as to the uh, mood and intent of Congress at that point in time when you're going to cite contempt of Congress there. And, and really, you know, most of us are familiar with the Watergate break-in, um, the cover-up of the tapes, et cetera, et cetera. So that I don't want to get into a, a detailed discussion on that, but Nixon's attempts to cover that up, even after um, Congress had subpoenaed the tapes, you know, once the tapes became public knowledge, they were altered. There were sections of the tapes that were um, allegedly overwritten, um, before they were handed over, you know, Nixon initially agreed to hand over transcripts, which is not what Congress asked for. And when he finally gave the tapes over, there were these omissions in the tapes. Um, and clearly Congress did not accept that. Now, once he did hand the tapes over, I think it was a week or so later, he resigned from office. Uh, the handwriting was pretty much on the wall at that point in time that he was going to be impeached and most likely convicted. Uh, so much so that even without a conviction of any sort, uh, Gerald Ford had given him a broad pardon once he became president uh, of any future prosecutions on the subject, which if that doesn't scream guilty, I'm not sure what does at that point. Um, but I think Richard Nixon is kind of the animosity of Congress, which if you look at today's political rhetoric that goes back and forth, that's sort of where you see us going with some of this stuff, where the House is controlled by the Democrats and the the vitriol that's, that's there and just about everything you do uh, comes out between these two. I mean, there's daggers flying back and forth in every press release that you see. So I could see us certainly going down that Richard Nixon route. What do you think? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, like you said, it's all deeply personal. Um, it's just, it's almost to the point where it's two people, like, fist fighting on, like, the steps of Congress. That's what we're getting to, um, especially with the debates um, yeah. coming up. It's a lot of that. But also, I think with Nixon, you have similarities then and now where Nixon had a history of lying to the American people um, and getting caught doing it. He had, but let's be honest. What politician doesn't have a history of lying to the American people? <laughs> yeah, but he got caught, and it was really, uh, really obvious. Like, um, I could be wrong about this, but he was with Vietnam with the invasion of Cambodia, and he lied about that, or is well, yeah, the escalation, yeah. of the war, yeah. So that was there was that, and then I think it sets a precedent when a politician is going to lie and cover things up, and then do it does it over and over again. It tarnishes if the people can trust them. And, and we live in a world today that's obviously very cynical, but Nixon was kind of the first president that made people cynical yeah. because he got caught lying about massive things. I mean, JFK, looking back now, kind of did some of that too, and a lot of it, and I'm sure every politician had. But Nixon was the first one to do it, and especially with the impeachment, it kind of solidified him as a liar president. Yeah. And today we have that, and again, not being political, but it is just proven fact that President Trump is somewhat of a compulsive liar, contradicting himself constantly and changing his views on things and changing his stance on a lot of things and lying. And I think that that, that is a dangerous precedent to take, especially as a president. I mean, there are times when you need to lie and you need to maybe obscure things from the public. And I can understand that. But when it's obscuring and lying to protect yourself and to protect the position of power that you have, that's where you get into some dangerous territory. Yeah, and that's, you know... That's a very good point of having to look at uh, history and reputation. I mean, Richard Nixon, by all accounts, was a dirty politician. Uh, he ran very dirty, very negative campaigns. He would go out of his way to dig up stuff on his opponents and use that to his advantage. And, and a lot of the dirty politics that we see today, he pioneered. Um, but yeah, he was caught red-handed with several things, um, controversies while he was in office, and and it sullied his reputation, which did not help him in this situation. Was he a part of the McCarthy uh, he team was as a, well? He was around when McCarthy McCarthyism was yeah. around. Uh, I don't know how large a role he played. Okay. He wasn't particularly prominent. Just because that's another thing that's come up today as well, the concept of witch hunts and McCarthyism and all that. Uh, sure. I didn't sure. know if we could draw another parallel there like, with Nixon as well. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, but if you look at uh, President Trump, President Trump, he... I've seen various statistics, and depending on what news source that you, you trust or you reference, uh, I've seen things say... Every fourth word out of his mouth statistically is a lie. Um, and some of those lies are stretches of the truth or untruths or omissions or whatever. Um, but for someone who campaigned on political office based on not being a politician, he's he's got a pretty good reputation of lying like a politician does. Um, so to the point, and it's not just him, it's his staff. I mean, we have... Catchphrases, catchphrases in our vocabulary now, uh, thanks to his advisor, Kellyanne Conway, we have words or phrases like alternative facts, where a factual statement is made about the president and we're told, well, no, the president had was using alternative facts to draw his conclusions. Um, so it's, it's difficult in a situation where someone can get up in front of the public make a clearly and, and easily provable statement that's false and get away with it. And when they're challenged on it, simply don't talk to the press. I mean, we've had months go by with President Trump where there aren't press releases because, or news conferences rather, because when there's a news conference, people ask questions, and when they invariably ask questions that are going to get answers that aren't truthful, then it's just easier just not have those questions asked, it seems. Um, and, and part of that secrecy that we're seeing, I think, is what's driving some of the animosity at this point in time, too. So for, it's interesting to look at our historical 
incidents of impeachment and see how there are some parallels to what we have here. Some of it is legitimate, I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of it is politically driven in this very corrosive environment that we're living in right now politically. Um, let's come back and talk about the modern impeachment process. <laughs> Impeachment resolutions made by members of the House of Representatives are turned over to the House Judiciary Committee, which decides whether the resolution and the allegations of wrongdoing by the president merits a referral to the full House for a vote on launching a formal impeachment inquiry. This is kind of a sticking point right now that we're running into because one of the things that the Trump administration is calling for is that full House vote. Um, now, because the Democrats have the numbers, that full house vote will likely fall along party lines. But part of that is the opposing party who's being impeached uh, has the right to call their own witnesses. They have their own subpoena power and they have access to all of the documentation. And the situation right now is... That call hasn't been made. So they're having impeachment hearings right now, which is a subcommittee event. So the, the Republicans are, are kind of, you know, calling shenanigans on this one and saying, well, if you, if you want to impeach him, then, then let's impeach him. Let's follow the actual rules and procedures and everyone gets everything exposed to the public. And the Democrats don't seem ready to do that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, like we talked about in the last segment about having something that sticks, especially with Andrew Johnson, it might be a case of that, that they're, you could look at it two ways. One, they know they don't have any, they don't have anything that'll like stick and get him permanently, but they're talking about impeachment to damage him in the upcoming election. Or the second option is they're just gathering more evidence so that they have a full presented case. My guess is it's probably the first one that they don't have enough to fully remove him and, and get him through impeachment and they're just using it to damage him for the upcoming election, which could turn against them if he does what he did when he was originally elected and paints himself as kind of a martyr that's being dragged through the political mud by the, you know, the ones that are always in power and the ones that are controlling everything, which could help him, you know, and the other side. His, his proverbial drain the swamp yeah. is being dragged down into the swamp. That's a very astute point there. Uh, and, and one that, I have to agree with because I think one of the one of the mistakes that the Democrats are probably running into at this point is um, they are exposing themselves. Really, I mean, if they're not ready for for a formal impeachment, you've got you know the the hawks in the Democratic Party that are requiring that something be done, and there's not enough evidence right now to to stick, to get a formal inquiry going. But the half step that we're doing here could very well play right into Trump's hands. Um, you know, he's a master media manipulator. Um, and the last thing that you probably want to give an opponent like that is, is the fodder of, you know, a half followed procedure that would make him look like that martyr, that underdog that will earn more um, attention. Um, and you're right. We're looking at very long times for impeachment procedures to go. And we're talking like 18 months. Um, so that's well past the current election cycle. So even if they go all the way to impeachment with this, it's not going to happen during his current term. Um, so it may turn out to be a mistake to have started down that path and given the, the president, their opponent will say, uh, and out for it. Um, so the entire House of Representatives votes for or against a formal impeachment inquiry, uh, needing only a simple majority or a single vote for approval, uh, which they'll probably get approved. And if approved, the House Judiciary conducts an investigation to determine um, if there's enough evidence to warrant articles of impeachment against the president the committee then drafts articles of impeachment pertaining to specific charges supported by evidence. 
The committee votes on each article of impeachment, deciding whether to refer each article to the full House for a vote. And this is getting ahead of ourselves because we're not at that point yet. Um, no formal charges have been filed. No evidence has been offered. Um, so we haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, and for the sake of the country, we maybe we won't get to that point or beyond. Um, it's clear the aim of the majority of the Democrats is really to get President Trump out of office. <clears throat> and I'm not sure that impeachment's the right way to do that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I had mentioned this before, but the Democrats, and I know we're trying to, we're going to keep saying it, but we're trying to avoid being political. But just from my point of view, the Democrats seem extremely desperate because Trump took them by surprise initially and when won the presidency. And I think that they don't want to underestimate him again. But I also think that they're playing themselves out of it because they're doing something like this where logically you would think, oh, he's under impeachment investigation. That will take away votes from him because he's seen as a, as a criminal or as a, someone unfit to have the office. When in reality, we don't live in that kind of world anymore, especially because Trump looks for those kind of things and can spin them as a positive for himself. Yeah. Especially because he's appealing to his own silent majority in the country that look for things like that. They look for examples of the swamp, like you had mentioned. And they look for big politicians trying to keep the little guy down, even though Trump is nowhere near the little guy. <laughs> but he pre he can present himself as one. And I think that that's exactly what's happening. And I think that it's going to – it could potentially do more harm than good and probably will. Yeah, and I don't think it'll it'll help – uh, the democratic election process at all, uh, having Trump under impeachment without having articles of, in of impeachment there. I mean, if they are, if the Democrats are unable to file charges uh, against the president and present concrete evidence, it's probably going to backfire on them in the election. And it's going to have the exact opposite effect. But that's just my, my personal prediction there. Speaking of... Uh, the effects of impeachment. We'll come back and we'll talk about what we think the future of the country and the presidency looks like with uh, a pending impeachment. So everyone who's attended uh, high school knows that should the president be removed from office, uh, he would be replaced by the vice president. In this case, uh, Vice President Pence would assume office. Um, and I'm not sure that really has the effect that the Democrats are looking for. Uh, Vice President Pence um, largely supports all the same policies that Trump has. So from a policy standpoint, you're not going to get much. Um, and considering the current term, um, you're not going to have Pence in office very long without a general election anyway unless this carries over and Trump wins the election and the impeachment carries through into a second term, um, having President Trump removed by Vice Pres President Pence, what effect do you think that's going to have on the country? Well, I think, I think Pence in some ways is a scare, well, for my personal view, a scarier prospect than, than President Trump because Pence is a more traditional politician. He's not as loud and as boisterous. He's more of the guy behind the scenes for Trump. So I think if he was put in power, he'd be able to, he might be able to get more done in terms of, of policymaking and pushing his agenda forward. Not to mention he's extremely, uh, anti LGBT, um, which I personally don't agree with that, um, at all. But I think that that is one of the things that I've noticed about him that I think is, is particularly unsettling to see and to have someone that is so vocally against that, um, in office. And I know that it's, you're not going to have the perfect person in office ever, but to have someone like that, that is politically could be effective and has those kind of views, I think would be a, a worse prospect than uh, president Trump currently. Yeah. Uh, Vice president Pence does um, promote very traditional conservative Christian fundamentals, uh, especially when it comes to LGBTQ uh, from a standpoint of, of Trump not a particularly religious man, so he's not he's not preaching religious ideals like Trump does. So, from from that aspect, yeah, Trump might uh, Pence might be a little bit more dangerous than Trump to some of the 
um, points that the Democrats want to push, um, but not being as boisterous as you described them as, um, would probably be causing, I think, a little bit less controversy in some of the public statements and foreign policy initiatives that Trump kind of undertakes. I don't want to say he's running, you know, a, a foreign policy because he seems pretty scattershot in his approach, um, almost in an erratic fashion. Um, I think domestically, uh, Pence could could possibly be <coughs> a little more uh, caustic to the Democrats. Um, but from an international standpoint, I think he might come across a little bit better internationally. What about the impact on the financial markets? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, we can see here that the <gasps> during the um, Nixon, when Nixon resigned, the S and P five hundred dropped twenty five percent. But during the Clinton impeachment, the S and P rose by twenty two percent. So it is going to throw things in a tor- uh, turmoil. Excuse me, um, in both directions. And I think, especially with Trump being a, or at least he was. I'm not sure if he still is having a lot of financial. Uh, I guess cloud or or reputation, he could very well talk to people that he knows, you know, friends that he has a lot of backroom deals, and kind of maneuver the markets to reflect negatively if he's impeached, which we'll touch on at the end. He alludes to a kind of a new civil war if he's impeached. Right. So there's a chance that he might, you know, try to manipulate the markets to his favor to give that impression to people as well. Yeah, and I and I tend to agree. Um, Trump, if nothing else, has proven to be um, rather manipulative of the financial markets. Uh, He seems to, in the time he's been in office now, and even during the 2016 election, he has a tendency of making statements and, and taking actions that have a direct impact on the financial markets. And... Generally, when you see a politician do that, it's usually in response to a market shift. You know, uh, Obama or Clinton trying to inject uh, some additional money in the economy during a recession period. Uh, Reagan restructuring the tax structure during prosperous economic times, um, part of his trickle-down economics so that that prosperity can, can reach other people. Um, usually you see a president doing that for, at least on the surface, the greater good of the country. With Trump, I, I'm not sure it's quite the same motivations. Um, the biggest thing that we see with Trump, two real big things that we've seen with Trump, have been his uh, tax break, which ironically was a five-year tax break, Um which tells me he he kind of felt he was going to be a one-term president and he didn't want the backlash of that uh, tax break, that rebound on that tax break to hit during his presidency. Uh, and it would hit on immediately on the next president. And the other thing is the, um, the trade war with China and various other nations that we're running into right now where you're seeing trade goods, common trade goods, commodities, electronics, you know, luxury goods are increasing as much as 25 to 30% to get them into the country now. Um, and the cynic in me wants to know who's profiting by that? Who's making that money? You know, how much money is Trump and his family and, and his various enterprises making off of this? Because it makes no sense to do it if there isn't profit. Um, so anything that happens from a Trump administration, I'm skeptical about from a financial standpoint, I have to wonder where the gain is, who's making the money. And as with anything with politics, follow the money. If you follow the money, then you'll see where the motive is. So my concern with the market from an impeachment standpoint, is yes, we know you're going to see volatility, um, but that volatility is going to be driven by inside people that are manipulating that market for their own good. 
And ultimately, it's not going to be the country that benefits from that, at least not as, as a whole. So there's a legal impact to consider with this as well. Uh, Donald Trump, um, back on September 29th, retweeted a tweet from a, we'll say, controversial pastor. And it said from Donald Trump's actual uh, Twitter account, Real Donald Trump, uh, if the Democrats are successful in removing the president from office, which they never will be, in parentheses, it will cause a civil war-like fracture in this nation from which our country will never heal. Uh, he was quoting Pastor Robert Jeffries, or Jeffress, um, and it was uh, sent to Fox News as well. Um, that scares me, quite frankly that the President of the United States, even though these aren't his words, he's retweeting the, we'll say threat in this case. Because to me, this is a threat that if Donald Trump is removed from office, there will be a civil war. What are your thoughts on that? I think he's just pandering to his audience. He's playing to his audience. I mean, he's historically, throughout his presidency and during his election, seeks to radicalize people and he seeks to radicalize the, um, uh, I don't want to say disenfranchised, but the people that have felt left out. And that just so happens to typically be people that are also white supremacists. Yeah. Um, so I think by latching onto this and saying this, I personally don't think there would be a civil war. I think this is totally outlandish, but I think that by saying this, he's charging up those, you know, the alt-right and the white supremacist and the people that worship him to continue to be radicalized and to come and either literally or metaphorically fight for him come impeachment times. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm like we had the whole point of the show, if we'll ever get to impeachment proceedings, but if we did, I wouldn't be surprised if there were people radicalized, you know, alt, alt, uh, alt-right people, you know, either protesting or trying to storm the, uh, Congress or something like that. Um, and I think if he were to make the call to action, I think they would come, you know, and I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if he did as a last resort. Well, and, and there was an article on the daily beast that we cited in our show notes here, and they talk about this post and Donald Trump's involvement with it. And, and they basically said that the talk of a civil war like fracture has been the theme of the right for, for some while now it surfaced in this case. Uh, in Charlottesville in 2017 during the violent clashes between white supremacists and protesters. And it was that same clash when commenting on it that Donald Trump labeled the white supremacists, labeled both sides as fine people, Um, which a lot of people took offense to uh, and thought it was inappropriate for a president to be labeling white supremacists as fine people. Um, Basically, the article goes on to say that the idea of the Civil War fracture has gone hand in hand with this prospect of a race war for quite some time now. Um, And there have been talk of race war since back in the 60s during the Vietnam era. Um, So this, this isn't a new concept, but I think this is probably the first time in history that you're kind of seeing it, if not promoted by, at least accepted by a sitting president of, you know, okay, so white supremacists really isn't that bad. They're fine people. And when you get that stance from the chief executive, where do you go from there to try and solve that? Um, Well, I don't know. As you were talking about it, it made me think a lot about when Lincoln was elected uh, prior to the Civil War. I mean, the South said, if Lincoln's elected, we're going to secede. And Lincoln didn't even show up on the ballot in some southern states, yeah. and he still won. And it's something, it reminds me of something like that. I mean, the Civil War, the nation was still fairly new, and we had a lot of things we needed to, to work out, especially with the issue of slavery, which was the big one. Um, and I think today we don't really have that big issue that is dividing us. I think it's just political beliefs. And I mean, sure, you could cite, um, you know, class warfare and wealth inequality and things like that. But I think I think it's always been this way. I think that white suprem maybe not white supremacy to the extent that we're seeing now, but I think there have always there's always been 
a disparity between races, especially with those in power. I just think it's been more behind the scenes and, and, and it was never talked about. But now with President Trump, because he's not the type to hide things, well, hide his views on things, <laughs> he's always the first to tell you what he thinks. We're just seeing more of that come to light. And I think that it's so radical in a bad way to see a president just say whatever comes to his mind. Because before, um, just the other day, I heard a, a tape of, I believe it was Nixon and maybe Gerald Ford um, talking about something. And they were just casually throwing out racial slurs. Right. But this was a recorded tape that was a hidden in, during the Nixon administration. But now you can get something like this on on Trump's Twitter. Yeah. And it's it's such a a radical change of um how a president functions in the media and especially Trump because he obviously utilizes Twitter. How how we're supposed to handle that and what we're supposed to interpret from it. Whereas before the president was seen as a kind of a title, like something that you would carry with uh some kind of honor. With Trump, you realize that they're just people and that they have these beliefs that maybe you know, your racist uncle had, but now your racist uncle is the one that's in power and maybe always yeah. has been. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, the, the one thing that I think is kind of scary about this is there's a CNBC article uh, that talked about that there's ample evidence now that suggests that Russia had used Facebook ads to inflame racial tensions during the 2016 uh, presidential election. And, you know, we've, we've seen the results of the Mueller report and there hasn't been sufficient evidence to suggest that Trump was involved in any outside influence of the president, presidential election. But there was sufficient evidence that came out of there to suggest that Russia was involved in influencing the election. And it wasn't that they were trying to tell you who to vote for, or who not to vote for. They were dividing the country on racial lines, along racial lines. And that divide influenced who people voted for. Um, and that kind of outside, like if, if Russia can see that those divides exist and they can find a way to manipulate them through Facebook, a social networking platform that can influence the outcome of an election... That's kind of dangerous stuff there. I mean, to me, that that speaks of a groundswell of animosity along racial lines that suggests that a race war may be something that someone really is trying to trigger, at least tap into for a racial, um, we'll say profit in this case, for political profit. Um, do you think that there's racial tensions that could be manipulated like that? I think there are tensions, but I also think that things like this, the tactic is to divide people as much as possible because the more people that are that the more people are divided, the easier they are to control and to influence and to manipulate. And I think that instead of it's easier said than done, but instead of, you know, feeling the racial tensions and seeing things like that, I think that if we were instead to focus on the things we have in common and the things that we share, then things like this wouldn't be such of an issue. I think people are so determined to... It's that, that age-old thing of, I want to feel unique but part of a group. And I think that we're seeing a lot of that now. And I think that comes out of both racial tensions and with the political situation that we've got now, political tensions. Because it's difficult to have a Democrat and a Republican talk to each other seemingly with without some kind of animosity. And it, it goes to... It seems like it goes to you as a person. It's not just your beliefs. It's who you are as a person. Yeah. And I think that that's a lot of the issue. And, of course, Russia, who is, well, not really our enemy. They're kind of, they're another global superpower. It'd be, it would make sense for them to want to manipulate us in this way because it's the easiest way to do it. And it's really easy to do it, as you can see here. And the impacts that it's had now with, you know, influencing, influencing our elections. Yeah, and it's not like the United States hasn't had a history of influencing other nations' elections. I mean, CIA had an entire division devoted to that. Um, the Washington Post had an article that talked about some of the practices that Cambridge Analytica had undertook. Um, Cambridge Analytica was deeply associated with the Trump 2016 
campaign, they use something they called psychographic techniques um, as opposed to demographic techniques. Um, they basically would go out, w- take a step back a second and kind of explain some background on Cambridge Analytica. So Cambridge Analytica is a UK-based company that had U.S. operations, and they would accumulate data from multiple data sources, um, one of those being Facebook. Um, And they did so by running this questionnaire on Facebook, and people would answer this information and give Cambridge Analytica this information for free. And then Cambridge Analytica would then basically scrape their friends lists and get information about their friends as well. And their, their job was to analyze all that data, determine who was, because, I mean, you and I are both well aware of the fact that the country is very polarized. And that tends to be the case in most other countries where they were active. It wasn't about taking someone who was a staunch Democrat and getting them to vote Republican. It was getting that, that group in the middle there who was the undecided group, that that swing group and and influencing them and manipulating them to do what you want. And that's largely what Cambridge Analytica did. And they learned this tactic in other countries. Um, For instance, in uh, Trinidad, they had a practice where you had two minorities in Trinidad and they ran a campaign to suppress the vote. And they suppressed the vote with willing participants, like we've had voter suppression in the United States where people have been intimidated, they've been attacked, you've had poll taxes, all these other things to get certain people, certain groups not to vote. Cambridge Analytica was actually, um, we'll say brilliant. I'll give them the, the credit in this case. They were brilliant enough to manipulate the youth of this one minority in Trinidad to think that not voting was a way of protesting. We're not going to vote because all politicians are evil, all politicians are corrupt. And by doing that, they were able to swing 6% of the vote towards their target party just by convincing the youth of the other party that voting was was unfashionable. Um, and, and really, it was brilliant the way that they did it. But... They were employed to work with the Trump administration as well. And some of the statistics that came out talk about the Trump administration spending $16 million on Facebook ads versus the Democrats spending about a million dollars on Facebook ads. Um, And this is the dominant social network that we're talking about here. And it's about manipulating people's perceptions, just like any, any political campaign really is. So Trump has really based his presidency on his nationalistic values, his make America great again. Um, But really it's about dividing Americans along a class line. Um, And that divide that's there, you know, it's, I think it's always been there. He basically drove a, social media wedge right into the middle of that and separated it even further and has been able to exploit that to his use. And I think, if anything, you're going to see that type of tactic and that type of um, split um, really exploited should he be removed from office for impeachment reasons. Um, And I don't know if that's something the country could... (laughs) Um, sustain or come back from. And, and, and I think that's what scares me more than anything else, is there, the, the divide's there. And most politicians uh, traditionally have not attacked that divide, and that's the one thing that Trump has done. He's recognized that, and he's exploited that, and he's, he's pushed that divide further apart. What do you think about that? Um, I, think, I think there is a certain truth to that, but I also... You know, there was a time before 
television, right? So there weren't any television political based ads. But now, especially with local elections, you see them all the time. They're they have low production value and no one really takes them seriously because they're targeted at, you know, people that are easy to manipulate. So you see these kind of ads and you think, oh, they're just a norm. We see them all the time, you know, before you watch Jeopardy. And I think that that is where social media will head because we've got we've got Trump is the first one to really exploit it. I mean, you had Obama do it more for the to get the youth vote and to spread his message right when social media was becoming a thing. But now we've got Trump that is using it to divide people and to slander political opponents. And I think that that's setting up a dangerous precedent that future politicians will most likely take advantage of as well. So I think that social media is just becoming another avenue for political slander to a certain extent. And I think that it does seem scary, but I also think we're ignoring people's ability to normalize things. And even we've seen that with Trump so far. I mean, when he was initially elected, everything he said was making headlines. And now every day he he just says whatever he wants and we've just kind of grown used to it. And you have to remind yourself that this, this doesn't have to be the norm right. and that we can have a president. So I think seeing these tactics used on social media will become just as normalized as that. And I think, I think you're right. I agree with you. Um, television is a great example when, when Nixon and uh, Kennedy debated each other, it was really the first time you had televised debates and you had a traditional politician like Nixon get up there who was coached and rehearsed and polished in his responses and, and his, his policies uh, get up there and debate Kennedy, and because Kennedy was a modern uh, media celebrity, you know, basically, and and had that movie star personality about him, he had the foresight to allow them to put makeup on him, and as a result, he looked better on TV, even though those people that were listening on the radio all agreed that Nixon won the debate, Ultimately, it was Kennedy that won the election because he was able to take that new technology and, and use it. Now, granted, he wasn't he wasn't using it to influence others so much as to um, make himself come across better. Uh, he wasn't trying to divide the nation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, social media is just another tool that's being used in the political process. Uh, no different than TV was. My concern has been a politician who is keen enough to see where the divide is. It's like it's like fighting an opponent um, who knows where your weakness is. If you're in a boxing match and your opponent watched your last fight and knew that you probably had a rib injury, and he's going to come in there. And he's not going to toy around. He's not going to dance with you in the ring. He's not going to have a fair fight. He's going to go after that damaged rib. And he's going to beat you in that rib until you fall and you can't fight anymore. Um, it, is it dirty fighting to do that? Maybe. It works. But it works. Yeah. And I think that's sort of what Trump is, is Trump is that guy that's going to go in there. He's, And and a lot of this, to his credit, comes from his his business prowess. Um. Trump's not a politician. He's a businessman, and he's a businessman who's made his fortune by exploiting other people's weaknesses. Um, he just happens to be taking that same tactic to politics, and as a result, people that play by the traditional rules are crying foul as a result. Is it unsportsmanlike? Maybe, but should polit has politics ever been sportsmanlike? I mean... You've had political campaigns that have attacked, uh, you know, candidates' dogs. You know, it's like candidates' wives. And so it's like dirty politics isn't something that's unique to Trump. Um, I think Trump may do it better than other people, uh, certainly more effectively than other people. Um, I think the thing that probably bothers me most is that we have those weaknesses as a society. We have those racial divides this this far from the Civil War and, and with you know civil rights being at the forefront of a lot of our discussions, we as a society are still very fragile when it comes to that sort of thing. And we now have a politician who can masterfully manipulate those weaknesses. 
And I don't know, maybe I'm a little disappointed in society for being, being that fragile. Anyway, I think that was... And on a real uh, high note. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, you know. We're all doomed. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was what we had this week. Did you have any uh, final thoughts for us? Just remind yourself that it's not, this isn't normal and it doesn't have to be. <laughs> yeah. I think those are good closing words. Uh, this has been another episode of Insights into Tomorrow. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback. Feel free to email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can check us out on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. You can check us out. Our videos are up on YouTube at youtube.com slash insightsintothings. And you can get the audio versions of this podcast at podcast.insightsintotomorrow.com. And I think that's it. Another one in the books. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye.